Gee, Flipper understood every word that Bud and Ranger Rick said. If we do make contact, we have to decide if we're dealing with interstellar immigrants, intergalactic invaders, or just tourists with tentacles. One tiny misunderstanding could turn first contact into first combat, as in the Forever War, Joe Haldeman's gritty novel about a galactic culture clash. In Damon Knight's short story, To Serve Man, we are visited by friendly aliens eager to serve mankind with a side order of fries. Other stories at play on our xenophobia include John Wyndham's The Midwich Cuckoos, filmed as Village of the Damned, Jack Finney's The Body Snatchers, filmed twice as Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and John Campbell's shape-changing alien in Who Goes There, also filmed twice as The Thing from Outer Space. Also, during the 50s, EC Comics produced a galaxy of creepy alien invaders and infiltrators. Those Cold War comics inspired Larry Hancock and Michael Cherkis to create their graphic novel, The Silent Invasion. The Silent Invasion is a 1950s science fiction mystery we like to describe it. It takes place in Union City. Matt Sinkage is investigating the unidentified flying objects of the time uh, and finding himself stymied wherever he goes. It turns out to be much more than that as he starts to become uncomfortable with the neighbor beside him and just other people in the area who he starts to suspect might be aliens. In fact, there are even a few people who disappear into alien ships. Eventually, over the course of the 12-issue series, um, it becomes a lot more than that. It becomes more of a political thriller involving uh, the, the men running for the Democratic uh, nomination for the President of the United States and uh, just whether perhaps he's being abducted and taken over by aliens. So is the alien invasion a metaphor for government conspiracy? I would say that the silent invasion was more a metaphor for just the, the times, the, the, the way that the American people were looking inwards at themselves and saying, we want to be pure, we want to be wholesome, this is the best country in the world, and let's get rid of all this little scab and scar tissue that's around communists, get rid of it. Um, anything that they saw that wasn't um, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, if you will, um, we want to exercise that out and get rid of it. We want to be America. And the aliens were just more of a symbol of, here's something that's different, here's something that's to be afraid of, here's something to be, to fear. And let's get rid of it. And then there are the folks who don't think alien invasion is a metaphor for anything. They believe Uncle Martin is a Martian. These inquiring minds who see flying saucers in the swamp gas are profiled in Douglas Curran's book, In Advance of the Landing, which inspired a documentary of the same name by Dan Curtis. Nancy, run some clips while I try and make first contact with director Dan. I'm Larry W. Bryant here in Alexandria, Virginia where I operate the uh, Washington, D.C. office of a group called Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, formed in the late 1970s to uh, investigate what the government knows and when it knew it about UFO reality. Something crash-landed in New Mexico uh, in 1947, leaving uh, debris, bodies, apparently, uh, of the occupants, snatched up by uh, military authorities, spurred it away for intelligence analysis of whatever was found on the alien bodies recovered. Roswell stands as the answer to basically what the government has been doing for 40 years. If there are no such thing as flying saucers, why do these agencies feel compelled to withhold information on their activities as regards UFO researchers and UFO encounters. I got him. Dan, why are some people desperately waiting for the mother of all motherships? You know, I think all of us look out into that starry sky, and even if we don't believe in little green people coming from some strange planet, there's a kind of wonderment about what's out there. Um, certainly for the people that I talk to, they're very much um, looking for some kind of spiritual salvation. Um, so it's like God wrapped in stainless steel, in a sense. Um, and all of them have this deep spirituality. So they've replaced the traditional kinds of um, religion with, with a belief in space brothers who have some kind of super intelligence and divine gifts that uh, you know they're going to bring to us. So I think there's a yearning for that, wanting to have something or some 
power help us out. Not everyone. I mean, there are those who believe that there are little gray creatures abducting people and causing, you know, all kinds of horror and, and uh, mutilation. But um, most of the people I dealt with were uh, looking to space saviors. The Ethereum Society is a religious, educational, non-profit organization which has, for the past 36 years, been responsible for disseminating the messages received through its founder president, Sir George King, from cosmic intelligences who man the craft we call flying saucers, and most importantly, upon acting on these messages. Now, with all our heart and soul, let us join together in holy mantra. Om. Uh, I consider myself to be ordinary in that, uh, you know, if necessary, I'll eat meat or uh, I'll uh, drive a car. Uh, we don't uh, withdraw from life. Um, I'll even watch a television program. I mean, goodness gracious. Goodness gracious indeed. Dan, now that you've met people who've had close encounters with Mork and DT, have you picked up any tips on how to spot an alien? Is, is this it? <laughs> I think there are lots of them walking down the street. Um, well, in fact, there are. I mean, if you talk to some people, <laughs> they'll say, uh, well, it, uh, they can disguise themselves so they look just like us. You wouldn't be able to tell. And in fact, some of the early contacts, uh, George Adamski and so on, uh, claimed that um, there were people amongst us who were alien, but in fact took on the form of human beings. So there's still people who believe that. Um, but the kind of standard form now seems to be the, um, and in fact in the film I have people trying to describe what aliens look like. Um, generally it, it seems that um, they have kind of large heads uh, with wraparound eyes as uh, Betty says. Um, uh, no real mouth to speak of, no protruding ears, and kind of short, about four feet high, and gray skin. During the 50s and 60s there was the other um, kind of um, the Venusian model, which was, um, sounds like different cars, but uh, they, the tall, slender, long blonde hair, kind of blue eyes, sort of Nordic uh, alien. I don't know what's happened to them, I, although I think some people still believe that those, those, those kind of aliens are around. UFOs were everywhere in the 40s and the 50s, and the books about them sold millions of copies. Well, even recently was Whitley Stryber's best-selling communion books about how aliens keep kidnapping him to poke his nose and his bum. What is this lasting appeal of UFOs? They're like, they're like Elvis. Well, I think it's the greatest mystery in the 20th century. I mean, no matter how many... I don't think there's anyone who, who even if you're skeptical about it, it's still, well... Maybe something is happening. You know, I've said that um, it's a little bit like the medieval map makers who, you know, looked out beyond their shore and saw, didn't know what was out there, and said, "Here be dragons." And I think, you know, we tend to look out into space and say, "Here be space aliens." We have to dream up something because we don't know, and maybe we don't want to be all by ourselves in this great vastness. Maybe that's the other part of it. Yeah, I can see that. Thanks, Dan, and keep watching the skies. Very few scientists believe in UFOs, but many think we are not alone. Check out Is Anyone Out There by Davis Sobel and Frank Drake of the Drake Equation fame. They explain how on October 12, 1992, half a millennium after Columbus makes first contact with the New World, NASA begins a 10-year search for extraterrestrial intelligence. 100 million tax dollars will be spent searching for life. They should check out the September 1992 issue. As NASA's radio telescopes scan the galaxy, computers will analyze the signals for something, anything. If they do find evidence of life, do we strike up a conversation or do we duck and cover? Next week on Second Nature, scientists say we may be able to use technology, heavy industry, and large machines to turn Mars into a planet like Earth. Hopefully before we turn Earth into a planet like Mars. Also, nature versus nurture in the best two falls out of three.